Back in January, just before the one-year anniversary of the January 6th attack, Attorney General Merrick Garland raised eyebrows when he slipped this single line into a half-hour speech. The Justice Department remains committed to holding all January 6th perpetrators at any level accountable under law, whether they were present that day or were otherwise criminally responsible for the assault on our democracy. It remains the most public and direct statement we have from the Justice Department addressing its intentions and the public expectations regarding the federal investigation into the attempt to overthrow the 2020 election. Until that speech, the Department of Justice had been mum on the issue of whether it was investigating anyone besides the rioters themselves. As for the people who planned January 6th, who incited the riot, financed it, ran fake elector schemes in support of it, or pressured election officials and state legislators to overturn results, we knew nothing. But now we are starting to get a clearer picture of what federal investigators are up to. In a series of scoops since March, the New York Times has reported that the Justice Department had substantially widened its investigation to include Trump and his allies' efforts to obstruct Biden's win, the fake elector scheme, and the financing and planning of the rally that preceded the riot. That one of the planners of that rally is cooperating with the federal investigation and that the federal investigation has brought on a career federal prosecutor specifically to oversee the investigation into efforts to stymie Biden's electoral certification. And then in the middle of election night last night, the New York Times landed another scoop about the federal investigation. The Times reports that late last month, the Department of Justice asked the House committee investigating January 6th for transcripts of interviews it has conducted. The House committee has interviewed nearly a thousand witnesses, including Trump White House officials, and Trump family members. That request was made last month. As for whether the committee will actually turn those transcripts over, it was the chairman of the committee speaking last night. Are you planning on turning it over at some point? Well, once we finish our work, but we're in the midst of our work. See you. Uh, if they want to come and talk, just like we've had other agencies to come and talk, we'd be happy to talk to them. See, but we can't give them access to our work product at this point. So you'd be more or less okay with like an in-camera review? If they said they want to come and look at something, we'd say, come on. But we can't share it. You know, we can't give them, you know, unilateral access. The committee is going to have several public hearings next month to showcase its work product to date. Why wouldn't they be willing to share these transcripts with the Justice Department? And what does the Justice Department asking for these transcripts in the first place tell us about how far along its investigation is? Who better to ask than Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Alabama and professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. Joyce, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Uh, first off, can you help us understand the distinction Chairman Thompson is making here? He would be OK with letting the Justice Department review their transcripts, but he won't just hand them over. How is that different? Why does it matter? This is something that lawyers will be familiar with. He's offering DOJ the opportunity to come and sit in the committee's offices, review documents, take notes on them. But he's saying you can't have physical copies. You can't go back and put them in your computer system and scan through them and, and use them in whatever way you want to. You can use your notes, but you can't have the original documents. So what could a Justice Department investigation use those transcripts for? A lot of different things. It's very interesting. This might be one way to uh, streamline the process of deciding what witnesses you'd like to interview or put in front of the grand jury if you're DOJ. You can look through the notes, decide who has information not on matters that the committee is interested in, but on criminal statutes that DOJ might be investigating. So that's one possibility. I don't think that these transcripts become a substitute for DOJ thoroughly investigating witnesses on its own. It is perhaps an aid. In some cases, DOJ can be obligated to turn over information from witnesses, although not typically when it's in the hands of another branch of government. But lots of good reasons for DOJ to want to take a look at these transcripts. So, Joyce, as you know, I'm one of those people who keep saying, where oh, where is Merrick Garland? I'm impatient. And the defenders of Merrick Garland often say, well, he can't comment publicly. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So let me ask you this. From the public reporting we have so far, is it possible to tell how far along this DOJ investigation is? Or is that all still a black box? 
I think you can speculate, but to be honest, I think we'll find out how far along DOJ is uh, in its investigations when we wake up one morning to find that indictments have been returned. This isn't really something that you can gauge by knowing that DOJ wants to see these documents. It is suggestive of the fact that DOJ is engaging in a broadly based investigation that fulfills that promise that Merrick Garland made on January 5th, that he didn't care how high up people were, who they were, that if they were involved in January 6th, which I took to mean the entirety of the big lie, that DOJ was heading in to take a look. Now, I don't have a great segue here, but I absolutely have to play you this piece of tape we just got in. Former President George W. Bush was delivering a speech at his presidential center today at Southern Methodist University in Texas. And while talking about Russia and its president, he made what must be one of the biggest Freudian slips of all time. In contrast, Russian elections are rigged. Political opponents are imprisoned or otherwise eliminated from participating in the electoral process. The result is an absence of checks and balances in Russia and the decision of one man to launch a wholly unjustified and brutal invasion of Iraq. I mean, of Ukraine. <laughs> Iraq, too. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> 75. Uh, <laughs> I'm not laughing. And I'm guessing nor are the families of the thousands of American troops and the hundreds of thousands of Iraqis who died in that war. Joyce, shifting gears a bit before we run out of time. In Wisconsin yesterday, we saw a totally new legal approach to January the 6th. The actual Electoral College delegates in Wisconsin filed a lawsuit against not just the 10 Republicans who pretended to be the state's Electoral College delegates, but also a Trump campaign lawyer involved in the scheme and the lawyer who helped come up with the scheme in the first place. That strikes me as a way for individuals to hold the people who tried to overturn our election responsible in case the Justice Department doesn't. Do you think that case has legs, though? This is a brilliant lawsuit. It uses Wisconsin state law claims to try to hold the fake slate of electors accountable. It's a roadmap, quite frankly, for other states uh, to file the same sort of actions using their state law. What I like about this lawsuit is because this fake set slate of electors is still trying, even at this late date, to overturn the Wisconsin election results. They haven't yet conceded. This lawsuit seeks declaratory uh, uh, and injunctive relief, the sorts of legal remedies that would prevent and deter future uh, faux electors and perhaps this entire slate of faux electors from taking similar action. It would impose, if it's successful, large amounts of punitive damages. It is a very carefully crafted lawsuit to de uh, designed to both deter, but also to make it very difficult for these sorts of events to take place in the future. Let us see what happens. Joyce Vance, former U.S. attorney, professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. Thank you for your time and your analysis tonight, as ever. Take a look at this. These are the 108 public figures in Pennsylvania who endorsed Connor Lamb ahead of last night's Senate primary in that state. We had to shrink the font in order to fit them all on one screen. The list includes multiple members of Pennsylvania's congressional delegation, the mayor of Philadelphia, the Democratic leader in the state Senate. The list goes on and on and on. A lot of names. Now, take a look at this list. These are the 15 public figures in Pennsylvania who endorsed Lamb's opponent, Pennsylvania Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman. The most influential name on that list is the mayor of Scranton, Pennsylvania's sixth largest city. And yet... John Fetterman won that race by nearly 33 points yesterday, days after suffering a stroke on the campaign trail. Fetterman had been the front runner in that primary since the day he entered the race, but the Democratic Party establishment of Pennsylvania threw all its support behind Lamb in what was frankly a bizarre attempt to undermine a popular, plain-speaking, progressive candidate. But that was not the most bizarre attempt, sorry, to undermine a popular, progressive candidate in last night's primary elections. That was worse. She calls herself a Democrat, but Summer Lee said she wanted to dismantle the Democratic Party. Summer Lee, more interested in fighting Democrats than getting results. UDP is responsible for the content of this ad. 
That was an attack ad targeting progressive candidate Summer Lee in the Democratic primary race for Pennsylvania's 12th congressional district. The message there is clear. Summer Lee is not a real Democrat. If you want a real Democrat, do not vote for Summer Lee. But notice what it said at the end there. UDP is responsible for the content of this ad. UDP stands for United Democracy Project, a super PAC affiliated with the national pro-Israel group APAC. Now, set aside for a second the fact that that attack ad has nothing to do with APAC's stated goal of supporting Israel. APAC is not a liberal group. APAC is currently supporting 109 of the 147 Republicans who refused to certify President Biden's legitimate election victory. But here they are in a Democratic primary running ads saying you should not vote for a progressive candidate because she might fight with other Democrats. According to the progressive group More Perfect Union, that APAC-linked super PAC, along with another pro-Israel group, spent more than $3.3 million in that one congressional race trying to defeat Summer Lee. Right now, though, Summer Lee leads her more centrist opponent in that race by around, well, less than 500 votes, with nearly all precincts reporting. So that may not have been money well spent. We'll see. But elsewhere, anti-progressive super PACs have had more success. Last night in North Carolina, a group of super PACs, including those two that I just mentioned, spent millions to defeat progressive candidate Nida Alam in the De Democratic primary for North Carolina's 4th Congressional District. Alam was campaigning on an anti-hate platform after her friends were killed in an anti-Muslim hate crime in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. Outside spending in that race favored her opponent by nearly 10 to 1. Alam lost her primary last night by 10 points. Also in North Carolina, those same PAC spent millions to defeat Erica Smith, a pro-choice candidate who was running against a Democrat with a history of supporting anti-abortion causes in North Carolina's first district. Outside spending favored her opponent by nearly four to one. Smith lost that primary by more than 30 points. A similar group of super PACs have already spent more than $2.2 million to try and defeat progressive Jessica Cisneros in her primary race against the House's lone anti-abortion Democrat Henry Cuellar ahead of next week's runoff. So what were the lessons for progressives last night? And how can they stand up to this wave of outside spending against them in Democratic primaries going forward? Joining us now is Alexandra Rojas, executive director of the group Justice Democrats, which supports progressive candidates in races across the country. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining us this evening. Justice Democrats has been involved in a lot of primaries. I, we've discussed it, you and I, many times, AOC, Jamal Bowman. Is it fair to say that outside spending against progressive candidates has increased in recent election cycles, especially this one? That would be absolutely correct. And I would argue that there are several organizations and entities that have formed <laughs> since the beginning of Justice Democrats because uh, they would rather uh, and you know, you, you mentioned Summer Lee in Pennsylvania 12, uh, light money on fire in a lot of cases, then invest in uh, candidates that look like the base of the party, which is increasingly working class, progressive and, and women, especially black women being the backbone of this party. So it's definitely been an increase uh, in cycles and one that we've expected. But I think that's what's so exciting about this moment is that uh, at least in Pennsylvania 12 and, and some of these other progressive races around the country, it looks like it is going to be a defeat of corporate super PAC spending and an establishment that consistently tries to buy our elections uh, with corporate millionaire candidates. And we're seeing working class people reject that. Um, and so that's what we try to do at Justice Democrats is support these working class challengers uh, because it can feel really hopeless. I think across the country there, you, you pointed out they're spending over 13 million dollars uh, trying to uh, go against sometimes democratically elected uh, candidates. And so we're trying to, to go up against that. And if folks uh, so want to check this out. Yeah, go ahead. In this particular Pennsylvania race with Summer Lee, I mean, it's bad enough to have, you know, corporate back, super back spending dark money, et cetera, et cetera. But why has APAC gotten into this fight so aggressively? And why do none of their ads mention Israel, which is the issue they actually lobby on? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, what we have seen is that it's not just about uh, this one issue. It is about defeating progressive women of color in a lot of cases. It is about us. Uh, stopping this rising generation of diverse working class progressive leadership who is willing to take a stand on human rights across the board, no matter what country might be violating them. And so, you know, we have seen in this election that they are going to spend whatever they can, but there is, you know, they can spend a lot, but 
you know, it's about progressives building the infrastructure cycle after cycle, which I think we are seeing uh, the first cycle in 2018. Obviously, we had a huge upset election with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez unseating Joe Crowley, the rest of the squad from Ayana to Rashida to the next cycle. There was Jamal Bowman and Marie Newman and Corey Bush. And so uh, we are feeling yeah. really, really good, even though it's really hard right now for so many, because cycle Quick. after cycle, we are growing against an institution that has question. had decades. Of, of support before. Go ahead. Sorry, we're almost out of time, so I'm jumping in. Quick last question. If Summer Lee wins the general election, gets elected to Congress, joins the squad, what's the strategy? Is there going to be a lot more uh, flexing of progressive muscles in the House? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, we're all on board to make sure that we get through uh, the general election. If she gets elected, she would become the first uh black woman to ever represent the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and, you know, yes. we are very explicit about what we're doing at Justice Democrats, which is building a mission driven team on the inside of Congress that's going to fight for the, uh, you know, solutions that match the scale, scope and urgency of the problems that we're facing and reject corporate PAC money. Uh, and we're going to make sure that that especially uh, heading into November, where, you know, we, we don't know what the what the majority will look like um, is going to be really critical. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We'll have to leave it there. Alexander Rojas, Executive Director of Justice Democrats. Appreciate your time. Thank you. In 1991, the U.S. women's soccer team won the world title, but they did so wearing hand-me-downs, jerseys that had previously belonged to a U.S. boys' youth squad. Players had to buy their own shoes and make do with a meal stipend of just $10 a day, meaning the best player at that tournament subsisted nearly entirely on peanut butter sandwiches and free Snickers bars. You might think that after winning the World Championship that year, the women's team would earn a little respect from the U.S. Soccer Federation. But they didn't. Come 1996, the same team won the Olympic gold medal. And yet for all that glory on the field, the players were making about $10 a day. When they asked for bonuses after taking home the Olympic gold, a soccer official told them, quote, don't be greedy. That official suggested they should be happy enough that they got to wear a jersey that said USA on it. The U.S. women's soccer team has been fighting for pay equity for decades. And even though the team has won a record four World Cup titles as well as four Olympic gold medals, they have been paid pitifully less than their male counterparts, despite having had far more success on the field and having generated much more money for the sport. When members of the women's team filed a federal equal pay complaint against the U.S. Soccer Federation in 2016, they noted that the women's team brought in nearly $20 million more a year than the men's team, but were paid almost four times less. It has taken a long time as well as a contentious gender discrimination lawsuit against U.S. soccer to finally enact change. But it has finally paid off. Today, the U.S. Soccer Federation announced that it has reached a deal to give equal pay to the U.S. men's and women's national teams. For the first time, players on the two teams will receive the same pay and same prize money, in addition to guaranteeing the same paychecks for taking part in international matches. The deal includes a provision that will pool the unequal payments the team received from FIFA for participating in the World Cup. So it is truly a landmark deal. I should also mention that I woke up to this news this morning and immediately told my youngest daughter, who is also a soccer player and is also these days rightly obsessed with the word misogyny. And she, well, she was ecstatic.